One of the busiest flight controllers in Mission Control is with us today on an extremely busy day. Visiting Vehicle Officer Tom Erkenswick joining us in between this morning's launch of the ISS Progress Resupply Ship and its upcoming docking. Tom, thanks for joining us today. As with any international partner vehicle arriving at the International Space Station, there's a lot of coordination involved. Tell us, if you would, what your team does and what type of coordination is involved in advance of the launch and docking. Sure, there are a number of things that we do in advance of the launch and docking um, going all the way out you know, a year or so in advance. We work with the Russians on how their vehicles can come to the station safely in terms of uh, their rendezvous radar system and their trajectories. And so as much as a year and then into six months away, we are looking with them at their preliminary trajectories to make sure they'll be safe and to make sure that there will be no interference for their radar system from any of the U.S. systems or any of the U.S. solar arrays. As we get in closer to uh, the flight, for example, about a month out and then a week out, we're working jointly not only with the Russians, but all of the U.S. teams to coordinate the planning of the U.S. segment uh, preparation for the docking in terms of array positions, radiator positions, again, making sure that it won't be any issue for their radar system and also providing an overview of what that rendezvous and docking will look like to the U.S. segment folks so that they understand the timeline of events from launch all the way to docking, whether it be a one-day docking like we'll be doing with this one or the more traditional you know, two- to three-day docking. And that gives everybody an overview of what will be happening on the Russian side so that we all understand it in advance and aren't having to ask a lot of questions in real time. This docking is going to follow two previous Progress launches with a profile to launch and dock in the same day. Historically, Progress ships have taken two days, in some cases three days, to reach the station. What challenges are involved in planning for this accelerated rendezvous? Yeah, I would say there are challenges both for the Moscow team and the Houston team. Uh, and certainly uh, when we do this with Soyuz, it'll be challenging for the crew as well. Um, but focusing on the ground teams, it involves a lot more uh, commanding and a lot more coordination just within the Moscow side because they have to take what used to be two days worth of activities and squeeze them all into, into one day. So you're doing uh, a number of rendezvous maneuvers and burns within a couple of orbits that traditionally was done over two days. And that's to get you up from the insertion altitude that the booster uh, drops the vehicle off and get them all the way up to space station. And uh, also, basically checking out all of the vehicle systems, making sure they're all working so that you know it's safe to bring the vehicle to the station vicinity. All of those things have to happen basically in the first two to three orbits. Whereas with a two-day rendezvous, you can do some of that on the first day and you can do some of that on the second day. You know, it's plenty of time and multiple Russian ground station passes to get all of that done. So you're compressing all of that into a single day. Uh, as 48P and 49P showed, it's obviously safe and, and quite possible to make all that happen, but it's certainly more challenging to do that in that compressed time frame. On the U.S. side, I would say it's not quite as much more challenging because primarily all we're doing is configuring the U.S. segment for the docking part and really aren't involved in the launch part other than the VVO job of monitoring what's going on with the Russian vehicle so that we can provide that insight to the U.S. team in real time. So uh, from that perspective, it's, it's pretty much the same. Tom, this progress is bringing up almost three tons of food, fuel, and supplies for the six crew members on the station. Does your team deal at all with the actual cargo, or are you and your colleagues strictly focused on the flight dynamics and docking coordination only? Yeah, we're strictly involved in the, the rendezvous dynamics and coordination, that part. So we work with a couple of different groups on the Russian side to make that happen. There are the, the rendezvous specialists themselves who are responsible not only for the theoretical design of the trajectories and to make sure that they are safe, but also for both the hardware and software for the guidance and navigation and control system that makes all of that happen. So we you know, are, are involved in discussions with them, um, not only for the flight specific part in terms of how the vehicle is going to implement all that on a given docking, um, but also the regular evolution of those systems uh, like anybody else they are you know, constantly trying to upgrade and improve their systems. Uh, anytime they make a significant change, we obviously have to assess that in order to understand if there are implications to how they're rendezvousing with the station and to make sure that's safe. And so that is part of our overall process. Then we're also involved with a, another group at the uh, MCC Moscow 
um, who provides that interface in real time uh, so that if anything off nominal happens, uh, or even just nominal, but maybe a dispersion, we can talk about that in real time and, and make sure we are coordinating that between the Russian and U.S. teams so that both teams understand the impacts to not only the Russian segment and the U.S. segment, but to the Soyuz or Progress vehicle itself. A visiting vehicle officer handles all types of visiting spacecraft. For a long time, that involved only Soyuz and Progress spacecraft, but now you have the Japanese H-2 transfer vehicle, the European automated transfer vehicle, the newly developed SpaceX Dragon craft, and soon the Orbital Sciences Cygnus spacecraft. So what are the differences in the planning and are there vehicles that are easier than others in your complex work to prepare for a mission? That's a great, great question. They're, I would say they're all challenging in their own ways. Uh, we kind of divide them into two groups. Um, there are basically what we call the docking vehicles, which are the Soyuz in progress, and then the ATV, which all dock at the Russian segment. And then you have what we call the grapple vehicles, which are HTV and Dragon and the upcoming Cygnus, uh, who are, which are all grappled um, by the crew using the SSRMS and then berthed at the US segment. So they're really very different tasks. The, the docking vehicles, uh, the crew uh, on the station, or in the case of Soyuz, the crew on the Soyuz are obviously you know, trying to monitor how the automated system is working and basically be prepared for any off-nominal situation that may require them to perform a response, whether that be uh, take manual control or even just send the vehicle away. For the grapple vehicles, it's similar in the sense that, again, your monitor, the crew is monitoring those vehicles to make sure that uh, if an off-nominal situation occurs that they're prepared to, uh, to send those vehicles away. They don't have manual control capability. Um, but then they also have the other task of actually going out and grabbing those vehicles with the SSRMS. And our team is involved in, in both of those processes. Obviously, on the grapple side, we're working very closely with the robos who are responsible for the SSRMS piece. Uh, and the ground, of course, is uh, watching the vehicles as well and involved in that monitoring process and, and helping make sure the crew can respond if necessary to an off-nominal situation. Aside from the fact there are no passengers, how is preparing for a Progress launch to docking sequence different from a Soyuz? With the Soyuz, uh, the Soyuz crew has a, a very you know detailed training and detailed flight data procedure that tells them how to respond to certain off-nominal situations. Uh, with the progress, since there's no crew on board, uh, all of that has to be built in to the progress vehicle itself until it gets really, you know, relatively close, you know, from space terms, <laughs> I would say, uh, you know, within, say, less than a kilometer before you can really even think about, um, you know, doing anything from the, from the station side in terms of manual control. So the, the responses with a Soyuz, where the Soyuz crew is on board, they can obviously do things at a further range and still be safe. With the progress, you really have to build that into the vehicle. With all that said, the Russians have done a really good job of making those vehicles uh, essentially similar and really completely similar from the flight dynamics perspective. So in terms of the automation for the guidance and navigation and control and the safety of those functions in off-nominal situations, um, the automated part is exactly the same between those two vehicles. So there's really no difference. Um, the only difference is that you have the crew on the Soyuz that once you get beyond the capabilities of the automated system that the, the Soyuz crew is obviously there and can do some certain things, whereas with the progress, you'd have to wait until the progress was a little closer before the ISS crew could do something using the remote control. Tom, you've done this job for some time. What do you like the most about your role as a visiting vehicle officer, and what do you think people would find most surprising about your job? Uh, the answer to those questions is actually somewhat the same. Um, one of the things I enjoy most about my job, in my case, since I work strictly on the Russian vehicle side of things, is working with the Russians. It's very interesting to work with them because even though we have a similar engineering culture, uh, obviously the social culture background is very different. And those things, you know, permeate each other in a working environment. So you have to, uh, if not understand, although that's obviously best, at least be cognizant of those social cultural differences and how they affect how you work with each other. Um, so understanding those things is a, is a really cool um, learning task and then you know, really interesting in person to, to work with them and uh, you know, learn how that works, you know, learn about their culture, teach them about ours. Uh, it's a really good, uh, good give and take on both sides. And I have found that to be one of the most uh, interesting parts of my overall job. 
Uh, and I would say that that's actually one of the most surprising things to people. Um, you know, if they ask me, what do I do? And I tell them I'm VVO and uh, what my job is here. You know, I tell them I would work with international partners. And uh, and that's the part that surprises them is that, the you know, there's so much cultural understanding that kind of has to go on in the background um, to really help help me, you know, do a good job at what I do. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to work on behalf of mission and flight operations. When I was uh, an undergrad student at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, uh, the cooperative education student coordinator actually came and did interviews on campus. Um, so I interviewed and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to get that job as a, as a co-op student. Uh, I did four tours here at JSC, um, basically four semesters worth of work. Uh, three in engineering and my very last one in MOD and uh, was fortunate enough to, to be transitioned to full-time after I graduated from uh, with my undergrad degree. So I was transitioned from a co-op to a full-time student or full-time employee, I'm sorry. And, uh, and I've been doing that ever since. So uh, I've been here full-time since 1994 and uh, I've been basically in MOD flight dynamics the whole time in various different positions, but uh, been working the VBO job pretty much since the 1996 to 1998 time frame. That's when I first started working the, with the Russians uh, on the concept of uh, how their vehicles would be coming to the space station, um, you know, how we could do that safely between the U.S. and Russian segment impacts, and how we would do the real-time operations as well. And, and that's really where the, the VVO job came into being, was understanding that having an interface to discuss and work out both in advance of the flight and in real time, any issues that might happen while their vehicle is coming in, um, it became obvious you know, pretty early on that that was a, a smart thing to do. Um, as you probably know, MOD and JSC has a, a function similar to that called the Houston Support Group that does that um, from a bigger picture for the overall integration of the Russian segment and US segment where they provide that interface. And so what our job is is similar to that, but focused mostly on the, the flight dynamics and guidance navigation function um, for rendezvous and docking and also for undocking and separation, just because those are such critical time frames with those vehicles being in the vicinity of the space station. Tom Orkenswick, veteran visiting vehicle officer and an expert in Russian flight operations, joining us today just hours before the docking of a new Progress resupply ship to the International Space Station.